Hi, and welcome to this video series on data harmonization. I am Dr. Christy Winters. I work at Gases Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. In the last couple of years, I've been working on developing a harmonization software. In this four-part video series, we're going to introduce you to important concepts for data harmonization, discuss some documentation issues, other resources that can help you better harmonize your data. And joining me today is someone who is learning a lot about data harmonization from a very practical level. Yannick, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I've also been working at GASES for the last couple of months and I've, done, I've learned a lot about data harmonization particular when working with the uh, with data from the International Social Survey Program. If you have any questions about anything you see in this video, you can always go to CESDA's Data Management Expert Guide, which is available online, links for which will be in the description box below. In today's video, we're going to talk to you about a couple of things, reasons for harmonizing variables and data sets. We're going to talk about the history of variable harmonization in a very brief way. We're going to look at important concepts and elements of harmonization and strategies for harmonizing your variables. It sounds great, but why do you think actually this is so important? That's a great question, Yannick. And the reason why it's important to harmonize variables is because it contributes to our basic empirical knowledge when we have a consistent measure across time or across space that we can use to compare human behavior or societies. It's also really necessary if you want to do any cross-national comparative research. You have to find ways of making things like educational attainment similar as a concept across a lot of different education systems. And it allows researchers to look at impacts across time and across cultures as well. Harmonization is a routine part of data management and survey preparation and survey research, but it's not always something that gets a lot of coverage or is talked about in a lot of depth, even though it impacts the quality of the variables profoundly. When you live in a place like Europe, which does a lot of cross-national comparisons across European countries, having harmonized variables allows policymakers to do more informed decision-making on which policies are having what impacts in what locations, but to do that you need identical measures. Yannick, yeah, like I know you've been learning a lot about harmonization since you joined GASIS. Would you like to talk about the historical origins of the process of variable harmonization? Sure. So, the idea of harmonization has already been developed with general approaches to statistical research in the second half of the 19th century. And also, the International Statistical Institute in The Hague has been established with the idea of standardizing data all around Europe on an international level. And not only uh, those institutions, but also the research demanded more and more comparative data so that during the last decades, large international survey programs developed and followed the idea of harmonizing and standardizing their data sets across nations and also across time. With all that history, uh, Yannick, the purpose of harmonization can really, though, be distilled down into two main goals, standardization and comparability. And I know that you've looked up a couple definitions about these. Um, do you want to tell us what you've learned about these concepts in terms of harmonizing variables? Yes, so you can find those two elements in almost all definitions. So Borkhauser et al. considered the goal of harmonization the to create data that measure the same conceptual variable and that are measured in the same units. Grande and Blaschik describe it as a standardization of inputs and outputs in comparative statistical analysis. And finally, Grande et al. define it as a generic term for procedures aimed at achieving or at least improving the comparability of different surveys. We're going to talk about strategies for harmonizing your variable data sets, but I think it's worth noting here, and we'll talk about this more in the next video, that actually data harmonization is something that you can do at various points in the research data lifecycle. It's not only limited to recoding your variables. Now, I know, Yannick, you've been looking a lot into doing harmonization strategies with your work with the ISSP. So what have you learned about the different approaches and strategies for variable harmonization? 
So the most common distinction for harmonization strategies is by time point. And people distinguish between input and output harmonization and between ex ante and ex post harmonization. Input harmonization is happening before you collect your data, before you go into the field to, to collect your data, you standardize your variables, your questions, your questionnaires, your surveys. So this is ex ante per definition, as it always happens before. Output harmonization might be planned before, but it's always done after the data collection. So if you plan your harmonization before you collect your data, but harmonize it only afterwards, that is called ex ante output harmonization, as you thought about it before. But you might also take secondary data and harmonize it to do analysis, comparative analysis, and this is happening with existing data, so it is called ex post output harmonization. And it's called ex post because all of the work about the thinking and the planning and the actual work is done after the data has been after, collected. When the data already exists. Right. So this is usually happening with secondary data. So we have been looking at those different approaches of harmonization strategies, but you should also keep in mind that those are only ideal types and it is often hard to follow them throughout the whole data life cycle. This is why usually it is more practical to do a variable specific approach and to decide on your strategy depending on the variable. For instance, the ESS has some ex ante output elements but also some input elements in its survey. Let's talk a little bit about each of the approaches or the time points in harmonization, starting with input harmonization. You want to tell us a little bit about when it's right or when the conditions are or some of the drawbacks of that approach? If you decide to do a long-term standardization and you will use certain items of your survey regularly, it might be very helpful to think about input harmonization. And it is also able to create a really high degree of international comparability for certain questions. But you should have in mind that it might come with very high costs and that it can be very challenging for certain variables and concepts to be harmonized across different nations or cultures. So typically the core variables of surveys are input harmonized. For instance, if you have variables which are asking how often you do certain activities or how con how comfortable you feel with certain situations, that is pretty easy to input harmonize as you can uh, ask the same question and bring up the same answer categories from uh, in all nations, in all cultures. All right, what about ex ante output harmonization? So ex ante output harmonization is much better in measuring regional or cultural differences as it keeps the variable at a country-specific level at first and only harmonizes it afterwards. But you should have in mind that it might come with certain conflicts when harmonizing the variable after collecting it. So this is typically done for demographic variables, such as education. For instance, education is already so different across Europe and the degree of education is hard to standardize before, so you collect it at a national level and then standardize it with uh, international classifications, which we will also see in another video. That's right, we're going to look at some tools that are being made available to social researchers so they can do more consistent recoding of, of education, education or occupation to other uh, social surveys. So look for that in a future video. Now the last type of harmonization that we were talking about before we move on is ex post output harmonization. So tell us a little bit more about that before we continue. This is actually a transitional solution and you usually work with already existing data and you reuse it and harmonize it to do your comparative statistical analysis. As you work with existing data, this can come at a relatively modest time and costs. 
but you have to keep in mind that it usually has the lowest degree of comparability and as you harmonize existing data you might lose a lot of information when doing it which can also uh, create a low degree of completeness. Another way that we can think about harmonizing data sets is to think about the extent to which the data and the variables have been harmonized. So one element of that you can think on the far end is being very, very stringent. And a stringently harmonized data set would be one where the teams took efforts to make sure that the collection methods were the same, that the collection procedures were the same, that the wording of the question was the same, everything was as identical as possible when doing their research planning for their study. And I can think of a comparative study of electoral systems where the wording has to be precisely the same in mm -hmm. English and all the English-speaking countries and the data collection methods have to be the same in order to get that completeness and comparability that we'll talk about in a later video. On the opposite end is a flexible approach to doing variable harmonization and there you do a targeted analysis or a targeted approach using the sociodemographic variables or maybe the theoretical variables you need, but you don't go out to harmonize an entire data set. So to bring it together with the input-output and ex-ante-ex-post strategies, input harmonization can be stringent or flexible as you might decide to do it strictly through the entire process or you might be a bit more flexible as you explained. But output harmonization is flexible by definition. Well, we've covered a lot in this video already. I think we've done a great job of setting up some concepts and definitions we'll be building on in the future. And as a reminder, what we've talked about in this video so far include why researchers and policymakers profit from and use harmonized variables and harmonized data sets, a brief historical overview of harmonization, some important concepts and elements to the process, and a couple strategies and when it's best to apply them. So what are we going to be talking about in the next video, Yannick? So after setting the concepts and knowing more about the strategies, we can now look on the process of harmonization and we will have a look on different steps that you should follow when harmonizing your data, but also challenges that you might face. And we will provide you with some quality criteria and examples of harmonization processes. Yeah, that sounds good. And just as a reminder, if you have questions about how to manage your data, you can go to SESDA's Data Management Expert Guide by going online using the link in the description box below. Again, I've been Dr. Christy Winters. And me, Yannick Brucker. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye. Bye.